manufacturing and supply chain industries on subjects of vital importance to the sectors and the economy at large. Today, we are going to talk about a distinct approach to manufacturing that could potentially be a game changer at a time when global supply chains are in a state of flux to a degree not seen at least since the end of the Cold War. And the world is seeking viable ideas for manufacturing and supply chains that can provide certainty, efficiency, and sustainability. The approach that we talk about today is being championed by an Indian multinational enterprise whose founder and chairman we have the pleasure of hosting for today's talk. Before I get out of the way with my first question to our speaker, let me introduce to you quickly the work and the background of our guest and his enterprise, which a lot of you are familiar with. Mr. Aravind Maligari, the founder CEO of ACUS, is laser focused on creating long-term value through innovative strategies. Aravind's differentiated approach to manufacturing has led India to increase in-country value add and gain a competitive advantage in the global arena. Over the last decade, he has built a vertically integrated aerospace ecosystem that drives scale and efficiency through co-located capabilities delivering end-to-end -end value streams. This unique ecosystem was awarded the prestigious Global Airbus Innovation Award in 2016 and recognized as the first of its kind in the world. By leveraging its manufacturing ecosystems, ACUS reliably delivers supply chain efficiency, efficiencies to its global customer base. The company currently engages over 5,000 people at manufacturing facilities located, located across India, France, and the United States. With Arvind's resolute leadership and strategic collaboration with global companies, his company has grown to be a preferred partner for global OEMs. Today, it, to add to the aerospace ecosystem that ACUS has built at Belagavi, Karnataka, the company is developing India's first 400-acre toy manufacturing ecosystem in Kopal, Karnataka, and India's first sector-specific consumer durable goods cluster in Hubli. It is Arvind's vision to transform India into a global manufacturing hub. Arvind, on behalf of our readers and viewers, a very warm welcome to you, to Makers and Makers. Now, okay. my, thank you so much for Thank you, Arvind. Thank you, Arvind. Now, my first question to you, Arvind, is about the title of today's talk for which our readers and viewers have joined us, which is how is the concept, this idea, this idea of this ecosystem, how distinct and unique it is to the manufacturing and overall global supply chain space? And how does this add or contribute to your vision of making India a global manufacturing hub? Over to you, Arvind. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so basically, if you, when we look at it, uh, manufacturing, an ecosystem is a natural, optimized, competitive, uh, you know, efficient way of manufacturing. We know globally, the manufacturing is driven by the quality, the schedule of delivery and the cost. And ultimately, these a manufacturing will go where it is most efficient. Obviously, it's subject to economical, geopolitical situations, but always manufacturer will end up, especially on the contract manufacturing side, where there is no IPs involved, it will go to a location where most efficient way to manufacture. So ecosystems is the, is the best way to do when all the supply chain vertically integrated is based in a single location. And that is how it has happened globally in aerospace industry or other industries. And those ecosystems were naturally developed over decades in Wichita, Kansas, Toulouse, Air, uh, you know, the France. These are, if anybody you ask in aerospace industry, they are natural ecosystems where you can completely build an aircraft. And obviously, you know, India in a commercial aerospace industry has not been where it needs, where it has a nascent start. 
you know early 2000 and uh, it's needed to grow fast if you need to grow fast you need to have an ecosystem that is what we saw as a gap in the country and we established a special economic zone in Balgavi to build an ecosystem and when we started it uh, uh, the in country value was only only about 20 percent on the machining side when we do machine products and over a decade I would say over a decade and a half I would say we have expanded this some of the products into 100% in-country value add and when you increase the in-country value add the stickiness and the value proposition cost efficiencies are tremendously increases and that will sustain the customer retention in a much longer period and that is what has driven us all along and uh, and aerospace doing that in aerospace has helped us understand how it can be replicated into other verticals and that's why we've gone and established two other verticals at that point in time thanks so much Arvind, uh, for shedding light on on the idea now um, as, as if you remember that popular saying that nothing can stop an idea whose time has come uh, see about this topic and about your contribution uh, to the industry uh, one thing that comes to mind is your journey you know your journey coincides with the journey of make in india it coincides with the uh, events of the last two decades where india has come to occupy and it, india is has become more aspirational ambitious about its uh, uh, space about its position in the global supply chain industry. So I'll we'd like you to elaborate a bit more on this from a global perspective and India's positioning as a global manufacturing hub. And let me I'll just add one little bit to it to to share with you where I'm coming from from a journalistic perspective. Uh, see, as you know, uh, to give you an example of TSMC, it's a it's a company in, based in a small country, which having started at the right time and having done the right thing has acquired such a phenomenal dominant space in the semiconductor industry, which I find to my mind a little bit similar to what you're offering from India's side, to work with global OBF, uh, OEMs, build a leadership position uh, in contract manufacturing and become a force that changes the shape of manufacturing in your sector. So please do tell me if I'm wrong in my assumption. But please tell your global perspective uh, of this idea, how important this is to India's position in global manufacturing supply. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's a kind of actually an apt example of TSMC being a, a contract manufacturer on the fabrication uh, of, of, a, of a semiconductor, which is which is obviously a high tech, but still end of the day, they, are, they don't have an IP of their own. They're a contract manufacturer. Uh, I'm pre pretty sure they have manufacturing IP, production IP, various other IPs, but not really a product IP. And as a contract manufacturer, we are in a very similar situation. And, uh, and uh, you know, is there opportunity for India or ACUS to be a, a, a global player? Uh, we are already a global player. None, almost all our competition is global uh, when, we, when, we, when we're trying to uh, win the projects and work with the customers and winning a customer. It's always global competition. And also the competition based on the verticals is, is Western or Eastern. We see that all the time. And especially in the aerospace side, it has been a Western competition because uh, that's where the industry was. And whereas when you get into the toys and consumer durables, it's most of the Eastern com competition, what we see is happening. And uh, this, you know, we started with a very simple thought process when I entered this industry. Uh, we were in services business and entered into manufacturing was, hey, India has been doing all these engineering services, IT services. Why can't we do manufacturing services? And I look at my job, my company as a, more of a manufacturing service provider. And that's why we are very vertical agnostic. And I see when there is a customer value proposition, when there is a capability, when there is a various, uh, uh, we can address the vertical needs and we can build and uh, leverage the India's capability, which is engineering and labor arbitrage. If we can bring these two, bring this thing to the table and we can compete. And today, our cost structure on the labor side is one third of China and half the Vietnam. 
our engineering prowess is very high, very good. And if we can bring these two as a combination, and especially on the manufacturing and engineer products, we could be, with nothing can stop us in the world as a country. As a, but there is a, there are definitely, there are deterrents, there are challenges. We can get into it further as we discuss what stops us from being there. And it's, it's, it's a predominantly, it's an opportunity exists and we have opportunity to leverage this to be a global player. So as you so rightly mentioned, Arvind, that these challenges that uh, come in the way of us becoming, uh, us um, realizing our full potential as an economy need to be discussed. Before we get into that, there is something very fascinating. Another thing that is fascinating to me is your journey as an entrepreneur. And it coincides, as, as is true with all, all good stories, that uh, the personal journeys, journeys coincide with the larger global uh, journeys. Uh, for instance, you, as you said, you started in the service sector and then came to the manufacturing sector, and you brought in a lot of good ideas from the service sector into the manufacturing sector in the same way that India is a global power, is, is a global force in services, and now it's time to do the same with, with manufacturing. Arvind, can you tell us, can you take us through the journey that you and I believe Mr. Ajit Prabhu started with you with services and then you foray into manufacturing? Yeah. Look, uh, you know, it was a, again a, a simple idea uh, when we started Quest. You know, both of us were working in, in multinational companies uh, and uh, we saw all the uh, IT service guys are doing globally survey IT services. We felt that engineering is an opportunity where nobody was doing it back in '97. And uh, and uh, my 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 partner, custom my partner's boss was willing to give the first project to do get it done outside. And we started the company. And the company started and uh, we started executing and we globally leveraged India's engineering prowess. And we had a capital basically swiped our credit card and, and get going and with some friends and family help and uh, we were able to get this going and uh, you know and nothing has stopped today quest global has at 17000 engineers you know my partner continues to drive this business grow this business and as we went along we went from our generation to aerospace industry aerospace industry other verticals as we did in aerospace we said we are doing everything for our customers, all the design activities, fixture manufacturing, manufacturing, uh, even cutting tool designs, uh, you know, all these things we are providing. And uh, and we said, hey, if we are providing all this, once we provided, they were going and giving it to somebody else to manufacture. We asked our customers, hey, listen, if you are doing all this thing, if you are to set up manufacturing, would you come to us? Absolutely, say, I said, you are pushing an open door. We would love to buy from India because we have offset requirements. Government of India had put an offset requirement with the purchase of Air India and Indian Airlines. And we are really desperate to, you know, meet those requirements if you want to do. And we felt that it was a good opportunity to start. And obviously, our investors at that point didn't like that idea. But that is for another topic to discuss. But, but later, we were able to focus and do manufacturing. And uh, later we separated by manufacturing, Quest Manufacturing became ACUS later in 2014, uh, rebranded and ACUS today stands as a multi-vertical manufacturing service business in a sense, the contract manufacturing, what is called in this industry, in this space. And uh, uh, in 2016 uh, time frame, even before Trump, even before uh, COVID, the toys industry, uh, uh, a, a uh, leader from Hasbro came and, and uh, uh, Amit Chakravarti came to India and he was looking at how do we really expand out of China and de-risk from China and uh, and he saw our ecosystem in aerospace and he asked us whether we could do something of that nature. I said, we are not sure whether we can compete with China at that point in time. And uh, when we looked at the products and pricing, we could we could be, we, we saw that we could be cheaper than China because labor content of 20-25%, if we can address the other material uh, uh, costs and various other elements and ability to source the material, right material and right cost, we should be able to offer 10 to 15% lower cost. 
and over a period of time we have been able to that number keeps changing depending on how china pricing strategy is chinese have different pricing strategies depending on the, their supply and demand situation and we are able to compete quite well on a global basis to meet the customer demands and uh, and and de- deliver and the journey has continued and and we saw this working for the toys industry then we expanded consumer durable industry but by bringing the by bringing the right partners like aerospace we built ecosystem by bringing in partners to quickly scale we have a joint venture with the magellan aerospace for surface surface treatment we have a joint venture with the uh, auburn dual for the forging and we had a, surf- a joint venture with uh, saab aerospace for assemblies which we bought out later when they decided to exit the country uh, exit this business and by doing this we brought in global players to be partner and part of the ecosystem to able to deliver vertically integrated solution to the customers which is today uh, has a what used to happen in 5000 kilometers could happen in 500 meters and and that journey continues to happen because we have so many things to do with respect to each of these verticals so much of efficiency is to be continue to be brought in scale to be done and manufacturing if you want to compete globally you need to be able to scale fast because customer demands won't stop when they come in they want to really be so, uh, real solutions and we need to be able to able to provide that for that you need to have ready infrastructure ready labor force trained labor force and also ability to you know in you know and organization ability to scale and only when we have these combinations coming through will be able to deliver the value to the customers and we have acas been able to put these things in place in each of these verticals and able to provide that to customers you know in a in a in a instant instantaneous basis and we can get you know the projects going within few months uh, of completely new activity for the customers great arvin uh, if we can focus a bit on the aerospace ecosystem that you built uh, the reason it is so exciting to me to hear is that uh, here is a company that has established an ecosystem that requires so much precision and i Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Acus uh, Aerospace Ecosystem has is the, India's first notified precision engineering SEZ in the country, which is a distinction in itself. Um, and this kind of a sector to establish it in India, uh, where you know in other parts of the country, uh, a lot of you know, manufacturers, entrepreneurs are struggling uh, with. Uh, With far less with with uh, sectors that require far less precision, such as uh, cell phone manufacturing or consumer appliances, to set up this kind of an ecosystem. And I I remember one aerospace ex, uh, expert, sector expert, who spoke to us in one of these shows. He said that for one aircraft, um, the kind of instructions that are required to build one aircraft, if you print it, it will weigh. It will actually outweigh the weight of the aircraft itself this is this, the instructions are down to such a minute detail so how to build that ecosystem in india requires a lot of effort requires a lot of vision so arvin i need you to share with the readers the kind of uh, challenges and the kind of uh, opportunities that you saw while building this ecosystem in india and how, what is your message to the readers um, who come from different manufacturing sectors and how to build similar ecosystems or similar best practices in other industries alvin yeah look uh, the building an ecosystem was we felt it was a necessity for a scale obviously you know you know in 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 india acquiring a 250 acre land 300, 250 300 acre land and 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 committing for that kind of a land and doing all this thing is very 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 uh, very expensive affair and uh, we also saw we couldn't do something of manufacturing in a long run in a city like bangalore and that's why we decided to do a, you know in the interiors of the hinterlands of karnataka in belgavi to set up this ecosystem and uh, able to build it it's obviously you know there are a lot of people who were at that time say say are you crazy to do this in go and do why don't you do it in bangalore why don't you go to gujarat why are you setting up a special economic zone why can't you just you know go to existing one we were very clear i was very clear that it this is not a overnight 
you know, uh, ROI kind of a situation. It's a 20, 30 year horizon, investment horizon, what I took. And 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 we have consistently focused and del- putting putting efforts towards that. And, you know, when I when I first made a statement that back in 2008, nine time frame, that we will do in country, our goal is to get 100% in country value add. It has taken literally, you know, 15 years or so to get to that goal. I mean, today, this year, we'll be delivering wheels for aircraft, which 100% in-country value add. We'll be getting the material from the Hindalco, a partnership with Hindalco, uh, Alumex, uh, to sub- buy the material, aluminum material, and then forge in our joint venture with Abedual at Squad, and then surf- uh, uh, machine at Acus and Surface Street at, at, at our API and ship it to customers. And this level of vertical 100% in-country value add, that has, you know, that is something which is very uh, rarely you can achieve in a in a in a single uh, region. You know, I would say in the in the in the world, in a, in a, especially in the in a, in, a, uh, in in Asian side, it's Western side. Absolutely, it was there, but not in India, not in Asia, other parts of Asia. But it has been strategically investment has happened. You know, there were ten thousand ton hydraulic press. That's the first in the country. We brought this press. You know, it, it was designed and built by our, uh, designed by our partner, built in China with the controls coming out of uh, Germany. It, it took us literally two years to get it up and running and another three years to certify by the customers and start using the parts from that. And these are long-term investments. These cannot be just, you know, uh, anywhere. The return on the investment of this could be 10, 20 years sometimes. So unless you have a horizon like that, you cannot invest in the aerospace industry. And today, I can proudly say that Every aircraft which is flying out there, you know, any any new aircraft which gets built has a part going out of Belgavi one way or the other. And it's somewhere in the, in the aircraft, we have a part coming up, some contribution happening there. And and we are delivering 100% on time and, you know, uh, zero PPM to Airbus for last 30 plus months. And that's the testimony by its, itself, testament by itself, that our ability to deliver from India, India has capability to do it, and you know, globally meet the requirements, meet the uh, challenge anybody to meet the quality and uh, productivity and also the cost requirement, cost, cost basis. And that is what our goal was. And we believe we are there, we can do it. We can scale this further. And we are still a drop in a bucket on a global aerospace, re- aerospace market perspective. So, Arvind, just quickly ex- extend on this. What was the reason that prompted you to build a vertically integrated aerospace ecosystem for which I believe uh, you were also, your company was also awarded the prestigious Global Global Airbus Innovation Award and recognized this ecosystem as the first of its kind in the world. Now, these are big, big words and I need to, I'm very excited to know what makes this ecosystem so unique. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, if you really, I mean, you know, the the typically what happens in aerospace and the, the aluminum mills produce the aluminum somewhere in the world and they are certified by the OEMs and then they go into a machine, you know, a, a, a supplier, which they cut and size it and then go to the machine shops to machine and surface treatment somewhere else. And these parts could be traveling in a U.S. basis or plants in U.S. These parts sometimes travel uh, several thousand kilometers before they finished and sent, I felt when we were doing this, these are all established ecosystems, you know, which it could be a little bit less uh, you know, distance wise. But if you, we felt that if you could put all this stuff in a single uh, zone with the right partners, we have, will be a lot more efficient, much less carbon footprint to do this. And it's when we, we could do this because we're doing it from scratch, from a clean sheet of paper, it could have never been possible to do something like this with an existing ecosystem, it will be more complicated. And you don't really install a new forging press, uh, you know, uh, you know, every year or every month. It happens once in few year, once in few years, and once in a decade, a lot of times. And because it costs twenty million dollars to put something like that, you know, a press like that, operate like that. So it is something when we when we put something, it becomes like an anchor bolt, and everything else around that can be built as an ecosystem. And that's what we have tried to do is, is build a man machining as a core competency and build everything else to increase the in-country value add. That is how it happened. We have done on the forging machining and we always want to do on the casting machining, but it has not been an easy one to bring casting capability to India. 
and uh, because western partners nobody is interested in coming to india because it's very difficult it's very labor intensive very very tribal knowledge and that is something which we lack in the country even today in my view right casting machining capability fascinating fascinating now from aerospace straight to toy manufacturing now would you call is this uh, was this a leap of faith or was this a natural progression it's see for me as we did in services anything i do has to have a a customer commitment first there has to be a market or a customer who is willing to buy who is willing to commit on our strategy and jointly we can you know we are willing to execute if somebody is willing to commit to a strategy and in this case hasbro i should you know uh, committed to the strategy they wanted to source 400 million dollar from india i said okay we will we, if, if we can commit to get to 100 million dollar kind of a uh, mark opportunity and we will be able to invest and set up something so that was an anchor customer we we signed up on and based on that and we were you know our goal is to build this from scratch and that's what we did initially we did a pilot facility of 40000 square feet then we built 200000 square feet then we built 600 600000 total capacity then now and then built another 600000 700000 square feet for infrastructure in copper toy cluster whole 400 acre zone has been established to do this again here as a country we have a polypropylene domestically market uh, manufactured and sold and abs is imported and these are the core plastics which are used in this product and then we have various other foam components you know the various you know various other spring components and other bottled items class classy items which can be bought the stickers and various items are taken painting still paints are still imported to into into the country uh, the basic paints because certified uh, toy uh, certified uh, industry certified paints are still not available it's still area we are working on getting that done and when with that we are able to most of the stuff is i would say in toys we are close to 95 to 98 percent in country value add when we use a pop polypropylene as a as a plastic material whereas abs if you use abs most probably you are at 70 80 percent because there is no real abs source in india to qualified abs source in india so that ecosystem continues you know today we have uh, you know just started last year that ecosystem uh, and also can support domestic requirements and export requirements and government has been proactively trying to support this industry uh, and we are in a discussion government is talking about potentially providing a pli to the toy industry because this employs a lot of people and this is the biggest strength of this industry is employment unskilled labor can be put into work within a one week or two week of training and it's incredible to uh, incredibly easy to move a person who is an, in an agricultural area into the women predominantly uh, agriculture into a manufacturing uh, facility uh, with a training within two weeks period and this could be the a, a significant job creator for the country and this is something which we keep telling the government and hey this is important and we are we are unemployment rates need to be improved that it needs to have something of the industry of this or garment uh, that type of industry needs to be supported and this we are asking to competitively uh, you know to be more competitive and especially to deal with some of the disadvantage of cost of capital and some of the the indirect subsidies and direct subsidies which are being provided by some of the competition on the eastern side we felt that you know a a a, a production linked incentive could be a way to do this and that is something which we are discussing with the government to support that well wow. i mean from where i sit i think this is a very brave and courageous courageous move in the sense that by entering into the toy industry you've taken on the might of china which i believe is uh or 80 which is a dominant force as it is in anything to do with manufacturing but especially in toy manufacturing i believe more than 80% is uh, china exports and produces more than 80% of the toy products in the world now this is something where we need to learn from you as to how and why do you think uh you can make a space for toy manufacturing in the country uh and compete globally what are the main advantages we just spoke about a few things where you can give opportunities to 
the skilled labor these are the things that help other industries also but to make a space and position for yourself in industry which is already dominated by it requires something more than what we already have what is that x factor what is that leverage that you have so much confidence in in taking on these forces look uh, there is there is there is india i would say again two pieces which i say engineering abilities and abundant labor with the labor arbitrage and the economic labor arbitrage are two biggest reasons why we decided that it makes sense to do this and long term it makes sense and look when when a customers globally are blindly sourced over a period of time 100% of their products in one geographic location that they're bound to change that mindset question i cannot dictate when it happens when we entered this industry we knew that it was going to happen but we didn't know when it was going to happen we didn't know that trump will come you know we become a president of uh, uh, us and he will make some changes and and put some actions and that has driving of other various other things and covid and various other geopolitical situation current geopolitical situation we see customers are willing interested very much interested in at least de-risking at least 15 20 25% of their product manufacturing out of china out of china into other countries and we believe we have a product platform and if i were to the we to we we felt that if i were to provide a similar platform similar level of confidence similar level of scale to our customer there is no reason for them not to work with us i mean today you know most of the if you really look at it, domestic manufacturing units are fairly small 10 20000 square feet facilities whereas when you go to look at vietnam and china the facilities are half a million square feet million square feet today we are been able to put a similar facilities similar ecosystem where the city could be ecosystem in china but we are able to replicate a mini ecosystem in a 400 acre zone and that is the what the idea is if we can provide that kind of a solution customer has confidence that our ability to deliver on time quality products at a competitive price they are happy to de risk any day it's no different than what aerospace customer told us we are pushing open door it's almost in the same situation but look as in aerospace there are uh, aerospace has hundreds and thousands of parts in an aircraft there are hundreds of thousands of different toys exists so capability is also different so it is important to understand what our strength is and where we start and start building for a product so yeah i was on mute i said ladies and gentlemen i was saying that i believe the connection is lost we soon have been back with us um, as you must have heard until now and i'm getting a lot of questions also uh, regarding the toy manufacturing industry i guess i need to log off and log in again no he uh, no some reason nobody is able to join i think okay i'll i'll ask i don't know what's just, the issue just I think I'll... yeah I, no both of us are here yeah we are talking this is this is being streamed live so as far as that is concerned you will join back i think the connection was lost so they have to join back says, most probably yeah, they have so to join back they have to join back so dinesh yeah. is working on that But this is going to be this is uh, being streamed on uh, various platforms anyway, where viewers can viewers can check as to what what happened, what transpired. Uh, we are also getting some questions, Arvind. But before yeah. that, you see uh, the natural question that comes to my mind is that similar efforts led by institutions and industry bodies, uh, especially in our country, have never worked so successfully, or at least are not. uh you know fetching the result the outcome that you have shown in, in such a short span of time of you know 10 to 15 years 
what is the reason and why have they worked in china i know i'm i'm venturing i'm uh, veering into a space which could be a bit political but considering given all the factors all all of them being equal what could be these reasons that are so much working in your favor and do not work in the favor of institutions and yeah institutions. look uh, it is you know the if you look at in you know we believe in china there was a concerted effort for the a province or a region to focus on certain industry certain particular vertical and go after it and globally convince that they can do it and they have done it over a period of time they have extremely efficient operations they are done and the, because there was some some committed resources put up behind it and when you come to a industry body this may be cii or fiki or whatever it is you know there are so many things to do you know there is no owner to his life is dependent on you know dependent on this the states you know each, each the, it, it's end of the day there are so many priorities when it comes to it work in in my mind it works as a private industry it works because we have this is no this is something no choice i have committed so much resources to make sure it is successful and i i am there in front of customer to communicate convincing them my team is there in front of the customer to convincing them to this is the right thing to do this is why it would succeed you know otherwise it would not be successful because priority ends of the day it comes down to priorities and necessary resources we put hundreds of millions of dollar capital deployed into this these verticals and these you know ecosystems to make sure they are successful and deliver customer and build credibility and when you build a deliver it builds credibility and that's a key element here end of the day customer wants a a de risk supply chain a global supply chain it's cost effective and delivers day in and day out with the least amount of maintenance that's what they want ultimately if wow. we can answer that they are there wow. so you uh, you refer to something that that uh, nasim talib the author of the black swan all the the skin in the game so you have the skin in the game and that is the differentiating factor and how you are able to push push this through our next question has to do with consumer dur- durables arvin now that segue or foray i'll not call it a segue but uh, uh, coming from uh, your choices the way you make decisions as to look at the demand and whether you want to you will be able to fulfill it or not your foray into consumer durables where does that come from what were the driving factors and how are you doing in that space yeah again uh, consumer durables you know uh, that got triggered predominantly what happened during the covid between india and china and india ended up raising barriers all the consumer durables predominantly gets imported from china and gets rebranded or rebranded and marketed in india that is what the situation is we saw this this has to this has to change because you know government wants to make in india atmanirbhar bharat all these thing it will end of the day india will have to manufacture this thing you cannot be having a dosa tawa coming from china manufactured in china sold in mysore it's kind of ridiculous yes, you know which is the case yes which, you know you know so we we believed that this has to change you know again we saw that there is an opportunity to do it and and this is i can do 100% in country value add on a dosa tawa nothing stop me from doing if we have to do in country 100% in country value add we should be able to compete globally yes can i compete globally on a global supply global uh, customers may not be there again but within india i can easily do that especially with certain tariff barriers and everything what government has erected to do that and once we do that then we have scale then we can compete globally without scale we cannot compete globally even in india today we have 6 million pieces of capacity non stick cooker capacity and and this is a physic one of the largest capacity installed in the country in last one year and this is the first year of our operation and we are working with many supply many customers and as as a contract manufacturer to support that wondershop is one of our key customer and we ended up establishing because of wondershop this whole facility because they needed some suppliers to do this because they are buying from china in the past so and and obviously this is where can i compete globally that's where the challenge comes because 
there are certain inbuilt logistics challenges, cost of capital for me to compete on a global basis. And that is something which I cannot address. I cannot change the cost of inland transport. I cannot change the cost of the 40 foot container, what it takes to go from a Mumbai port to uh, New York or LA. And those are the things where I expect government to play a role, a central government especially to play a role. How do we make it happen? Because I can only control what I control is basically ability to produce at the best cost, my product. And what happens with inland transport is, is completely out of my control. And obviously we can use rail a little bit better and there is no, there is no sea, uh, there is no waterways in India, much of it. And it's predominantly road transport. Road transport costs have come down, but nowhere near. We still see a significantly higher road inland transport. Our logistics costs are double than what it happens in China, bottom line, inland and international. So unless, and these are the products which are highly competitive, have two, three, four, five per hour margin. And you cannot have a double your logistic cost of 6% from 2 to 3%. And you cannot be competitive in a global market. And cost yeah. of capital is another reason, which which is obviously is a big impact on in, 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 the, in the industry, especially when you start talking about working capitals and, and, and talking about credit terms in this business. Those are all the additional challenges what you see in this industry. So cost of capital, just, I'm just curious about it. It comes from the interest rates being raised across the world or are there other factors also contributing? No, cost of capital is predominantly is, is a, you know, risk adjusted cost of capital, put it that way in the country. And when we see that and rupee depreciation, various other element comes into picture. I mean, typically in China, even today, the, the, the interest rates are lower, you know? Yes, Europe and US has moved up, you know, right. more, more comparable today, but right. then, then on top of actually, we may be in an advantageous situation when especially look at a rupee depreciation perspective, we may be in a, almost in a similar situation as US and Europe. But I'm not competing with US and Europe today in this manufacturing. I'm competing with, you know, e e Asian countries and where the, the interest rates are still lower. And I, I, I am disadvantaged by that when I have to borrow at 10, 12% when, when they can borrow at 5, 6%. Oh, that's very insightful. That's very insightful. Thank you, you, know? you for... Yeah, thank you for sharing sharing it with us, our readers. So they need to understand the, the challenges that entrepreneurs face and, and the association and the governed bodies need to focus on these areas as well, along with the policies, the yeah. pro-industries policies. And I believe they have taken it up, but these are systemic issues, I understand. That. So yeah. what, what do you think could be a way forward uh, for the government to be able Look to help? Up. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the cost of capital is something we have to uh, we have to uh, deal with it because it's it's much broader economic challenge, economic issues which we need to deal with it. And I'm, I'm I think look, we are okay when it comes to competing with the Western play. It's more of a challenge when it comes to the Eastern play right now on the cost of capital perspective. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, because in aerospace we used to compete with we compete with the Western players. And their, when their interest rate was negative, they could easily buy equipment, which was much more efficient than my labor arbitrage advantage. That was a big challenge for us. So, and, 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 and that is something which we were able to overcome by sourcing some equipment from Western countries and using working supplier from there, you know, able to be able to match the cost structure. And we have fully automated flexible manufacturing system in, in our Belgaum facility, which which is in line with what would happen in Western country. Wow. And just to make sure that we can deliver similar efficiency, because sometimes labor order itself is not going to get you where you need to get to when, when labor content in a product is extremely small. small. In toys area, it is, it, is, it is much higher labor content. So it's a different issue. But when the aerospace, the labor content is not that high. Absolutely. As a you percentage. Been, wow, you've been, you've been forced by fire, as they say. Having to compete with the best best suppliers in the world, who are being favored by macroeconomic circumstances, and you you fought with that and the kind of manufacturing practices and the learnings that you have taken out of this would be tremendous tremendous help to you and and to people and to the readers who are listening. Uh, yeah. That's where my next question also comes from. That is, uh, I think one of the biggest issues to my mind. Uh, ailing 
not ailing but you know, facing the indian manufacturing sector is uh, the perception the global perception that is building up for industries uh, which are more uh, critical uh, uh, with deep with critical supplies such as medicine for instance pharma for instance we have seen in the last uh, few months some instances where good manufacturing practices as they practice in the pharma uh, may, may or may not have been followed for which they are getting flack and uh, attracting uh, bad press and in some cases rightly so because of the casualties and all that uh, which, which is out there in the media my question is that you know from an industry where you're dealing with global oems who are so particular about precision such as aerospace where you are leading you are among the you know uh, front runners in this sector uh, what is your message what is the insight that you can share with companies how to do well in the global space in the pharma where we already have a presence in the generic space but that is not enough because these things are happening so what should be done from your perspective to be able to maintain good manufacturing practices to be able to build a perception that make in india stands for something stellar yeah, yeah. So, i think look uh, i I'm, I'm i'm you know uh, there is a lot of capability exists in the country you know um, but that is not a, meeting the global requirement for various reasons safety eh environmental health and safety we met several companies our organization cannot may not be able to meet and that's why they're not able to compete on a global basis it could be scale also that's a second issue but first focusing on making sure the esh and esg side of it is is taken care of that's the number one make sure that esg and ehs meeting every raw of the land is there is met and ehs and esg side of it and then comes the the scale the the esg ehs and, and able to comply and with the global requirements is more of a organization culture so it is ehs is what esg yes yes ehs is environment health and safety okay. you know yes. uh, uh, and uh, the the key is comes down to the organization culture more than anything else you know in my mind quality is not a product because somebody inspects at the end quality needs to be part of the manufacturing process is a manufacturing a operator needs to know the quality of the product output input coming output going out from him and if you cannot win this game putting more inspectors at and inspecting the, to the death Yes, there has to be an inspection system. Should be there. Processes needs to be there. Unless you invest the resources and systems and processes, to establish quality system. You cannot really build that culture, because a owner operator cannot make it happen. It needs to be an organization culture that needs to be built, and that needs to deliver. And that is the only way we can. Some of these organizations have. who have gone out and got into trouble where culture has deteriorated over a period of time you know some other focus has come in the financial focus became more most probably than a, than a getting a product out right so today you know for me number one priority is quality then schedule then comes the cost at any cost first is quality then comes the, your delivery meeting the delivery requirements and then the cost issue comes in once you commit to deliver meet the customer commit to customer that we are going to deliver we take an order it is always that order if quality is not there i don't care even if the schedule slips we will deliver quality products because end of the day it's our own credibility we have had several times we have to rework things and deliver so be it i would rather be late and get penalized for it than delivering a wrong product and if you know there is a miss be open to communicate to customer and live with the consequence what happens if there is a slippage in our system unknowingly so you got to stand up to it and live with it the co- there are costs associated with it, especially when you are in global play it could be millions of dollars but you have to live with it you have to take it on chin and learn organization has to learn if we cannot build a organization of that nature it's it's not easy going to be 
in being in a global play. Wow, I'm letting that sink in. These are very, very important, important wide words that need to be created, that need to be conveyed across our sectors. Thanks so much, Arvind, for that input, for that insight. Much, much needed uh, for our corporate professionals and businesses. Now, my uh, this le leads us to our concluding question, after which we'll take up quite a few, lot of questions that will come to us. Okay, all right. I'm being coerced by by my colleague to take questions. Uh, before that, Arvin, I wanted, since we're talking, and this is a great time for me also to ask about the pro-industrial policies by the government. There's a lot of things happening. National logistics policy, ease of doing business, make in India. Uh, what is your perspective on that? And is there something more that needs to be done? Look, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we were in making we are manufacturing in india we committed in india before make in india came uh, uh, and and we were doing Atman in your part doing 100 percent in country value at before Atman in your part part came so for me it is it's a uh, look uh, end of the day we know what uh, and india is capability but the the government using these themes to communicate outside is very important. Okay, uh, they people rally behind certain make in India, those kind of themes, and it, it makes it easy for everybody to talk about it, and a kind of a more of a ability to give a segue to so that we can pitch what we are and what we do in India, what the scale is looking for, what the mindset of the government, the government is prioritizing. These things, you know, can be used as a starting point of a discussion and provide actual solutions end of the day and is there any capital committed under make in, make in india to any private businesses no the, and under atman nirbar maybe there was a pli scheme i can say came out of atman nirbar bharat and those could be helpful and i i, I hope at some point in time toys will the vertical will see that benefit but you know but the point comes down to is you know nobody has to wait for these themes to come in if you see a business proposition, if the value proposition exists, you should go and start your business. Well, acting, what in entering, doing the manufacturing activities in these verticals, any verticals in that matter. Thanks so much, Arvind. Our audience members are getting a little bit anxious that their questions are not getting answered. Uh, so I'll just quickly take them, take two or three questions. Uh, one is from Mr. Mohan Naik from Makino. He asks, can India embark on airframe and aero engine MRO? If yes, by when? And if not, why? Airframe MRO is already happening in the country. Look, MRO is uh, in, leave aside the engine MRO. Let's talk about the airframe MRO. Airframe MRO is not about the it's 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 more about the turnaround time. How many days the aircraft is going to be down? On the MRO side for the A check, P check, C check, you know, if you're going to go down for C check, how many days it's going to be down and how committed you are to get that aircraft out on that day when you committed maybe 15 days before, one day, one year, whenever it was scheduled, they may be scheduled one year before that I'm going to bring the aircraft on this day and you're going to finish in this day and give it to back. And you must meet those schedules. And you have a systems and ability to do that. And it is not a labor arbitrage predominantly because if you take 2000 hours to do within that period of time or 1000 hours, it doesn't matter what it is. So it is important to be able to turn around that because every day aircraft is not flying. It's costing a whole lot of money to the airline. So key is number one priority is to make sure we have all the capabilities necessary to turn around the aircraft to the international standards number of days. And second comes, are we able to do in the same number of hours, labor hours? Or labor arbitrage, maybe 15, 20%, 30% against, you know, what is the current hubs of nearby hubs, which are like Dubai or Singapore or Sri Lanka, you know? And if maybe 15, 20%, if you're taking 15, 20% more hours, that arbitrage is gone, you know? So as the India, do we need, we need 
lot of MRO facilities because number of aircrafts are increasing, will increase. And I would say we are large enough aircraft uh, com uh, airlines, they will end up having their own MRO, in my view. If you look at you know what Delta does in US and everything, that's what I see on the airframe side. Now on the engine side, it's more of a rotables. The engine MRO will go to the most optimum location where it happens, cost structure perspective, because engine get dismounted, tipped out on a global basis. So that is more from the technical capability, you know, the cost and various other pieces comes in. And India is capable of having all of them. Today we are manufacturing parts for these. So why we will not be able to, you know, do the, you know, do the, do the MRO in India, provided all the process and, and partnership. And today, most of the time MRO partnership happen in partnership with the OEMs. So it's not, you know, it's not that India cannot do it. It's just a question of whether there is a value proportion exists. And government might have to put some kind of a weight behind it to make it happen, in my view. Only then some people will end up moving. Otherwise, there is no reason because especially on the engine side, the cost of doing an engine OMR or some other place maybe it's exactly the same as what I'm doing here. And establishing the whole new facility could be more expensive. And also you need to look at it, especially these aircraft, most of them are you know, your t before TPO, most probably those engines are going out. You know, I don't know how many, uh, you know, these are five, six year lease in the past. They were only holding five, six years. Today, they may be a little bit longer. And most of the TBOs are 15,000 hours now, you know, uh, total over how. So that also is another question, you know, if you longer aircraft holding pattern, owned aircraft holding pattern, then you'll have more, more, more opportunity for MRO. Wow. Thanks for that very informative answer. How much time do you have for questions? I have two or three coming up. And do you think you can answer a couple of them? Another couple of them should Another be fine. Another couple of them. All right. Yeah. Uh, Hardik Mistri from Siemens Digital Southeast Asia. He says, how ACUS drives digitalization as world sees that digitalization changes many things and various aspects in the Look, uh, digitization is is the is the key in increasing the manufacturing efficiency. I mean, today all our CNC machines are, you know, I can we can know the data, cut time, air time, you know, uh, OEs and all these things all digitally collected and 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 used, analyzed, and uh, before even a plant is set up, digital design happens and the flow and and movement of the equipment, and movement of the parts, you know, the 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 layouts and everything is finalized using that system. So digitization and every part we today, you know, especially all the new aircraft, 787, 350, uh, uh, three, including uh, 350, 380, and all are designed digital. If you, and today we have get digital models of the, the, and all the PCDMS, it's all integrated. Whatever I do inspection is comes from the original design of the aircraft. The section is taken out and transferred out. The part is transferred out. So the linkage exists all the way from the original, the full way aircraft design to the part level. So the, so that integration is happening. Pretty much we do and the shop floor is, is a paperless. You know, it, it's, it's digital tab. People have block the drawings if they need. And that is the only way in the long run it's going to work. Because any change, version changes, you don't need to run around with the paper, paper drawings and any of the stuff. So automatically all these automatically they will be able to see which part is running, which version is running, you know, is the latest version, you know, corresponding drawings and parameters are seen. And inspection also, a lot of inspection, CMM is moving towards optical, you know, various other uh, pro, uh, solutions are coming into the picture. So image processing, optical, all these things coming into picture on the, on the, so digitization is all happening, uh, even on the back end, you know, for us, SAP is the, is the source of finally all the data. And then there are other tools which are around for connecting to shop floor and quality systems and everything. And at the end of the day, everything has to hold up into a single system. So that's a part, a natural part of the process. Thank you. Know, evolution, I would say. Great. Uh, now, the concluding question is from Madhav Jindamwar. We have not many questions, but we have time for this one. Now, Madhav asks, he's from the toy industry. He says, uh, for toy industry, the biggest challenge that we're facing is how to speed up the new development in brackets quick development of new products please guide how we can make fast development of new products 
Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the product development in the toy industry is very, very, very interesting for me. We, as we enter the industry, we were originally as an OEM manufacturer. Today, we are ODM type of solutions we are providing to our customers. And we developed this capability out of Hong Kong. We, you know, because we knew that product development has a various phases, especially toy development. You have concept, you have, you have, a, you have, a, you have a model, a clay model, uh, you know, then prototypes and then finished product and then tooling and then final production. Our customer expect in 24 weeks, the product to be launched. Okay, maybe another 12 weeks or 24 weeks to be product to be designed. So it's it's a very tight cycle. And we have 20, 25 products coming in and going 50, maybe 50 products sometime in a year. And we finish up and get it out. So the tool uh, design, tool, tool design to, to uh, product manufacturing, 24 weeks is, is a lot of times is what they provide. No more than that. And it is a tough one. And it needs a scale because they all come at the same time. Fall season, spring season, is that happens at the same time. Christmas comes on 25th of every year, doesn't change. So you have to have ability to scale, you know, hundreds of engineers be put in to develop multiple products parallelly and do the tooling. Your tool capacity is a challenge. That's why a lot of tooling is, goes to China even today. So it is, if you want to, the design of the product is upfront design, more of a concept, are you focused on the concept? Or is a customer giving you concept? If if customer is given concept, how do you take a concept into the production? You know, and that is the area where you need to focus. And these are different skills, unfortunately. But it needs unless so for scale, you need to invest in each of these elements. So you need to see which where the customers are coming, which level the sometimes customers are coming ready to do the tool transfers to you from some other location. And uh, so tool transfer to production could be in 10 weeks time frame. So you might, might, you will have to figure out where you are playing and where your activities are and you need to correspondingly invest. And for us right now, the most of the design of the new product is happens out of Hong Kong, the office of ours. And we have a team there because that's where the lot of conceptual uh, understanding of the products exist for the global market perspective. And then the whole ecosystem exists in a quick uh, prototype development perspective. And wow. we expect it to transition over a period of time. India will be there. We know our copper toy cluster will have their own capability to do this over, over coming years. But initially, we have to be still play in the global market. Wow. Now, uh, folks, uh, the leaders who are watching this, now we, we should know at least one of the reasons why Arvind is able to dabble with these many industries and make them a success is the passion that he brings to everything that he does that he brought to the conversation that we have today, to your questions, his personal involvement in making everything so good and successful. Thanks so much, Arvind. Uh, our heartiest wishes uh, to your vision, to your goals of contributing significantly to making India a global manufacturing hub. Thank you so much for coming to our panel. Thank you, Anand. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.